it's a joy to be able to come back where I remember as a young person, a teenager, sitting about where you guys are seated. It was the same pattern back then that we sat right there. And uh, the Lord used really this as a starting point. I don't know if you know this, but my brother and I did not grow up with these dynamic voices that could sing really well. But somehow, this church inspired us to sing. And in teens involved that Word of Life had, we went up to Screen Lake, New York, and uh, it was through the grace of God that we sang a song called Noah Found Grace in the Eyes of the Lord and was able to somehow place in the top rankings. <laughs> it had nothing to do with our voices. It had more to do with our actions. We got the judges distracted from our voices, I think. And honestly, I really think that was true, and everybody seemed to enjoy it. But most of all, that was a starting point. We sang together. We also preach these 10-minute messages, and uh, which some of you would prefer I preach tonight, probably 10 minutes, right? <laughs> but that was what the maximum was in Teens Involved, and then you had uh, storytelling, and I did a little ventriloquism and things like that, and it all started right here. And so, what a blessing it is to be back, and most of all, I just want to tell you, I love my family. I love the fact that the Lord brought my wife, Alicia, into my life. She's from, Bus well, she didn't grow up in Bucyrus, but we met northern part of Columbus, Ohio, in Bucyrus. In fact, we were just there last week on Sunday. And uh, they claimed that they kind of arranged for us to meet, but it was really a God thing that we met. And uh, the last 13 years, we've been serving together in Korea, but we were, we were married in the year of 2000. And so this summer in August, we get to celebrate our 15th anniversary. And the Lord's blessed us with four little ones that you have seen around here. Michaela is the oldest, Karis and Josiah and Titus, they're all a part of God's incredible grace gifts to our life. But I love the fact of being a, a part of God's mission. It's, no, it's not an accident that we are uh, missionaries, although I'd never thought of myself growing up as one. In fact, I remember when my father was involved in pulpit ministry and we would travel sometimes as a family to share, I would think... Uh, it wasn't very cool to be a MK, PK, and people would ask at school what I was or what my father did, and I would say, I'm a missionary kid, you know. It was not something I was really proud about, but I really was a person that grew up in a background where we traveled, ministered together as a family. Sometimes my uh, father spoke to the men in classes. My mom would speak to the ladies, and, and then uh, my brother would take the teenagers, and I was younger, and I took the uh, little ones, and so we had a family package kind of growing up, and then my sister learned to play cowbells, and some of you know the Steiners, they're also a part of the missionary family here too. And so we've had a joy to grow up and to minister together. But now, now God has put us into a family that we get to go across a larger body of water, <laughs> to go across to Asia. It takes about 14 hours. People were asking about how long a flight is to Korea. Well, we traveled from Incheon to Texas and didn't know it was an ice storm when we arrived. And so flights weren't taken off, but when we landed the end of uh, February, the beginning of March, uh, we skidded on the runway. We really did. We slid and so forth. But we were there for a week, and uh, the Lord allowed me to be a part of a, uh, a, uh, an errancy of Scripture summit and came back, joined the family, and then we've been now in Ohio, of course, Tennessee, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, and uh, and now here in Parkersburg. And so we won't get to be in Parkersburg anymore after we leave you tomorrow, but we will be traveling a little bit in other parts of Ohio, back down to Tennessee to be with my wife's parents and siblings, and also to Georgia and Florida before we leave to go back to Korea on July the 17th. So that's kind of what package we're on right now. For those that weren't here Sunday during the Sunday School, let me just give you briefly a little bit of what we do. I have just a couple slides I wanted to share with you here, and maybe I can... Uh, know how, how this works here. Am I ready to go here? Perhaps we're on mission. I know that. There we go. This is a little bit of what we do. We're involved in evangelism and obviously discipleship. Those are two big, kind of like an airplane, wings of our ministry that we prioritize on. And it's a youth organization. Word of Life is started by Jack Wurtson 75 years ago. This is the 70th, 5th year celebration year. And it just started on the street corners of New York City. Jack Wurtson didn't know much about uh, church at that time. He got saved and he began to get on a band stool where he played uh, an instrument. And uh, then he began to use that same stool to share the gospel with. And he said, wow, there's a big world out here that needs the Lord. And he was very zealous. And he got together with a band of people and they prayed the Jabez prayer. That was before it became famous in a little book and so forth. But they prayed that prayer. And little did they know, or Jack Wurtson know, that eventually Word of Life would go into seven countries 
And uh, my brother and I were a part of pioneering the ministry in Korea. Beginning in 1995, we became officially registered with the Korean government. But we do ministries that I did have the responsibility to lead, such as camping ministry. And uh, that now is transferred to Jeju Island, which is about a one-hour flight from Seoul, Korea. It's an island that is known as a honeymoon resort island. So a lot of people when they get married love to either go there or our favorite spot in Korea is on the east coast where there's mountains and you can see the ocean. But it's called the Sadok Sun. But on Jeju is where a lot of people go to. In fact, it is the one airport that more planes fly in and out of than any other place on the planet. You may not have heard of it, but you look it up on the internet. You can go there and about, it's like a bus, every few minutes you can catch a flight to go to Jeju from Seoul, Korea. So it's about an hour flight down from Seoul, but it has a lot of uh, tourists, especially going there from China and other places. But we get to do camps there now. We just started doing that full time the last two years. But before we did that, we started camps on the mainland. And I want to just take you to what it looked like when we did English camp. On the mainland, we didn't have a beautiful camp piece of property. We rented a place in the, t in the city of Puchan, which was just outside of Seoul. And uh, the Lord allowed us, after several times of failing, trying to advertise it as a sports evangelistic camp, to use English as a tool to attract people and to teach conversation English, even though we speak and minister in Korean and other facets. But in our camping ministry, we have two types. One is a Korean unity camp for churches to come to, like with Bible clubs and so forth. And the other is English camp. And uh, let me just take you there for a minute to share with you what happens during a typical week. This is a video that we made for students to take back home after camp, kind of as a memory of their story and what happened during camp. So let's watch that just for a second.
afterwards you had fun, you made new friends, and most importantly, many of you build up your faith. As you know, I had the chance this week to be your Bible teacher. Every evening we looked into God's Word and we opened it up and we looked at some powerful stories that Jesus taught. He taught it to many people, some were religious, some were not. And as we went through those stories, we learned one key application. Remember, every night, one key application to apply to our life. So now you're getting ready to go home. Some of you are already home. The key is, is that you apply what you learned this week. There's a movie that we showed Friday night. You remember Facing the Giants. And the coach could tell one of his players, he knew it up here in his head, but he wasn't doing what he knew he should do. So he blindfolded him and he began to encourage him to do more than he thought. He said, it's impossible, coach. The coach says, you can do it. You can do it. And you can now do it. As you're back home, open your quiet time diary. Open it up each morning. And remember, as we've been reading this week, meditating, apply God's truth to your life. And as you do, you're going to grow. And we'll get to see you come back and see how God's working in your life.
camp is full of energy. You can see the blue team, red team, and there's always a lot of competition that happens. But every morning and every evening we have a Bible hour. And then we have cabins that their counselors meet with the uh, campers one-on-one. -on -one, and most of all, the camp is about seeing life change. And so at each camp we have young people that some come to know Christ as their first, first time as their personal Savior. Some thought they were saved and found out they really weren't. And they really make make certain of that while they're at camp. There's others that begin to grow, have a quiet time like for the first time in their life and they continue. It's neat to hear when they come back. One of the blessings of this uh, last winter camp when I was uh, getting ready to do the training with the uh, counselors as I was asking how many of you have been in a camp before? These are all Korean uh, college students now at our Bible Institute, but how many of you have been in one of the, uh, the camps in the past and nine of them raised their hand and how many have been in one of our camps either as a counselor or a camper? Seven of them had been a camper, two of them had been a counselor, and one had had no experience with us in the past. And that was pretty outstanding because we usually don't have that kind of racial. used to be when we started camps, my, my wife remembers this, we had people that had no tr background in camp, camp counseling whatsoever and so everything was started by scratch. And then we would go out in the streets and just try to beg people to come. It was kind of a novelty. They didn't, never knew what camp was like. And now we've had waiting lists, and we've seen the Lord establish a leader of that ministry. And so God's done some incredible things. And really, it started with prayer. I remember there were numerous times we would get on our knees and just ask the Lord to do a miracle because it was his camp, and uh, the Lord would show up, and he would do some things that we couldn't have figured out on our own, couldn't make happen on our own, but he did. From camp, we have students that come on to our SYME. That's a school of youth ministries in English. It's a discipleship training school that's for eight months. It goes from Monday evenings till Friday evenings. And they're with us all through the week. They have their meals and they're dormed in our school. And that's about an hour outside of Seoul. We have about 40 students that are in that program right now. Uh, some of them have been to our home from time to time. We try to have them over to also help them to understand that they came because they heard of the school, but there's more that they could hear and be a part of in missions and in ministry opportunities in their future. And so about half of them go on to our Bible Institute, which is located on Jeju Island. And that's one of the purposes of us having the School of Youth Ministries in English is to uh, provide an avenue that they can get their English level up, have a desire, a passion to learn God's word. And those that do are able to go there and study for one year. In fact, right now it's pretty economical for students to go there. You can go for one year. That's from September through August. It costs about $13,000, and it includes a trip to Israel, a study trip for 12 days. It also includes a mission trip to Thailand uh, for all the students, and that's all part of the cost. You can't really do that any place here in North America for that kind of package and so it's an incredible opportunity. So there are people from Japan, Taiwan, China, Korea, of course, and North America that attend this uh, Bible Institute. Many of the North American students are MKs, missionary kids that have grown up in other countries. And we've had them from Argentina, from India, and so forth that have come there. And this was the graduating class of this past year. Uh, we also uh, see those that go on to the second year, uh, the Bible Institute in New York. The credits all transfer, so if you go one year, you can transfer to any North American college, Bible college credits will transfer just as if you were studying at our campus in New York or in uh, Tampa, Florida. So that's an opportunity for people that you may not have heard of. Our ministry team has asked, or directors have asked us specifically to uh, begin a new ministry with family ministry being one of the big rocks of our future. And so we're praying that it won't just be uh, going there and us doing a good thing, but if it's meant to be, that it's a God thing. And so we're praying for a team to work in family ministry and eventually a, camp, a Korean director to lead this ministry as well. As just here in, in the United States, there are many issues that relates to the family that are huge. Divorce has been on the increase uh, rapidly over the last decade. And also there are other social issues just like it is here. We were in prayer today, as many of you, I'm sure, about even the desire of some in government to redefine marriage and that kind of thing. And we're in, pr in prayer about that as well in Korea as uh, Korea is a very fast-paced country that's main mainly copying a lot of things that's happened here in the West, usually about 15 to 20 years behind. But once they change, they change rapidly. And so we're in great need of prayer for family ministry in Korea. This is our church family that we are uh, working the last three years in establishing outside of our town on the south end of town. 
and somebody was asking who was taking our place while we're here, and we're very thankful that as an answer, that a prayer that we had 10 years ago, God brought a couple to serve alongside of our local church ministries team. We didn't have any other American couples that served in that capacity, and we desired someone who could be a coach and encourage, equip some of the uh, hubs that we were setting up for Korean leaders to work with local church ministries. And so a couple by the name of Jacob and Crystal Morris came to fill in that particular need, and God placed it on their heart, and now they're also shepherding with us uh, the church family that began here three years ago. And so we're very grateful for that. Well, tonight, I really have uh, been in prayer about your involvement, engagement, and what God wants to teach you, and also what God wants to teach me through this missionary conference. It's been a joy to hear the others speak night after night, and to know, obviously, that no one is here by accident. Everybody that comes is a part of a reason, and God has you here tonight for a good reason. So I would like us to bow in prayer and ask God to speak to us as we open his word tonight and seek to uh, understand what he would have to teach us. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight, are grateful just to be able to be called your child, to be adopted into your family. And I pray that tonight, as we look into your word, that you would teach us, you would speak to us, help us to think your thoughts, and mo most of all, help us to apply what you would have us to from what you want to teach us tonight. I pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, I love being a follower of Jesus Christ. I love being the husband of one wife. I love having a family, and I love being a part of the church family. Uh, did you know that being a part of the church, you are a part of an eternal organization that's not just here today and gone tomorrow. There is really only one church in the world with many different colors and congregations. This past fall, while I was teaching through a 32-week series in our church family, we came on the topic on basically what is the church from Acts, from the book of Acts. And it helps me to define things better. If I know what something is not, it helps me to know what it is better. So I a lot of times use contrast, what something is not versus what it is. And so I'd kind of like to begin tonight by giving you the title, and then after that by sharing with you what the church is not versus what it is. The title of the message tonight, if we were to put a title to this, it's simply this. We are called to pray. We are called as Christ followers, which I believe most of us that are here tonight would claim to be a Christ follower, a Christian, and in that we are called to pray. There's power in prayer. In fact, there's never a time that anyone can truly be discipled apart from prayer. And so this past fall, while sharing on this with our church family, I reminded them that the church is not a few things. And so tonight I'd like, to, first of all, just to direct your attention to what a church is not, and that will help us to define what it is. First, the church is not a theater. It's not a movie theater. You know, whether it was 90 minutes or two hours long, if it causes one to laugh or it causes one to cry, that usually determines, by many people's standards, the worth of that movie, right? It's an entertaining business. To go to a movie, you say, oh, that was an interesting one, or that wasn't so interesting, that was boring. That's a lot of times what it is. And, you know, many t people take that same thought or idea into the church. Oh, church tonight was kind of boring. I didn't get much out of it. You know, it's all about consumer-driven mentality. You must know that the church is not just a place to come to for an hour or two to be entertained, right? But we are devoting our life to something eternal, something that lasts forever. You must know that even though you might think you're the audience in the church sitting in pews, the truth of the matter is you're not the audience. You are not the audience. God is, and God is looking for worshipers. God is looking for worshipers. And so the first thought is, is, is it's not a theater. The second thought is this, is it's not a store. It's not a shopping center. What do we do at shopping centers? Well, obviously we shop, right? And you know what it's like. You go to a place that you, you know, you're looking for bargains or maybe you're seeing some th something on the shelf and it's the last item and you want to grab it before someone else does. And then you get out to the checkout counter and you want to find the shortest line so you can get out, get home, and obviously it's all about what you can get, right? And maybe for the best bargain or the best buy. If we don't find it at one store, what do we do? We go to a, another store, right? 
And I'm afraid that that language and that mentality at times has become a part of the church. Whether it's in Korea or here in the United States, many times it can be a consumer-driven mentality or culture where we go and we shop for ourselves. Well, church isn't to be about us, right? I remember Warren Wiersbe once saying that the whole purpose that he goes to church is to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for no other reason, that's why we should be at church on a regular basis. But also we know in Hebrews 10.25 that even as the days get worse and worse, there's another motivation behind that. But what else is a church is not? It's not a restaurant. (laughs) You know what happens at a restaurant, right? It's where we come to be served and to be waited upon. Imagine if you went to a restaurant and perhaps you walk in the doors and someone says to you, hey, hey, why don't you go over there and clean off that table that's in the corner. There's going to be some other people coming after you and... I'm sure it would be appreciative if you clean that table off. And they give you this rag, it's wet, and you take it and, okay, wash off that table. After you get done washing the table, they come back to you and say, hey, could you go in the kitchen and cook your own food? Because after a while, there's going to be some other people coming, and, and they'll cook your food for you, but you go cook some others first. You would maybe not go back to that restaurant, right? Well, the church is not a restaurant. It's not that mentality that you come in to be served, but rather, as Jesus said, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a what? A ransom for many. And so the mentality, it's not to be seen as a restaurant. It's not a gas station. You know what the gas station's all about, right? Where you simply swing in once a week for a quick fill, and then you go on your way. You may not even remember who pumped your gas, or maybe you pumped it. But in the old days, somebody pumped it for you, and you may not even remember who they were, and you don't really care. And you get out, and then... You don't think about it all week long until your tank starts to get empty and then you need to get your quick fill again. Well, some people think of that as Sunday in church, right? Come in for my quick fill, get my fix, and then I'm off and I don't even think about it the rest of the week. Some people have asked, what is a Korean church like? And to be honest with you, many people don't think church really connects to their life Monday through Saturday. It's just a Sunday activity. And so we have to remind people that the Word of God is not given just for our information, but for our transformation, and that it should affect your life. The last idea that I'll present here is it's not a fitness center. Now, you know what? Fitness centers are usually built for people that want to be fit, or usually it's more for those who are already quite fit. In fact, if you're not fit, you feel kind of embarrassed, and you really don't want to go to a fitness center because you don't think it's for you, right? And so the church is really not a fitness center only for people that are fit, but rather the church is what? Well, I'll simply describe it as a family. It's a family, the family of God, that's devoted to sharing with one another God's love. There's nothing quite like it. Certainly it's true. Sometimes the church does not act like the church is supposed to, but whenever the church acts like the church should, there's nothing quite like it in the whole universe. Do you know where the word church came from? Well, in the original languages, or starting out where before English came into being, as far as the Bible being translated, in the German, it was called the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord. Unfortunately, many times people have thought of the church as a place. It's usually tied. Oh, I don't go to church. I don't mean, I don't go to that building. Now, obviously, the building is a place for us to gather, but we should never think of the church as a building, right? Because that's not how Christ wanted it to be when he created what's called an ecclesia. You can say that word together in just a second. It's the word ecclesia. Can you try that? Let's try that together. Ready? Begin. Ek means out, and ecclesia means called. So essentially, called out, or better translated perhaps is the gathering. The con- a congregation or gathering assembly. That's referring to people, right? It's the body, the bride of Christ. And so we know that, but sometimes we really don't get that. We, we kind of know that, but it's not fleshed out in our mentality. I believe that the church, programs will come and go, but the church will prevail until God calls his bride home. And it's a wonderful privilege to be a part of the church. And Jesus once said this, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In Matthew 16. Or he might say, upon this rock, I will build my called out assembly, a people called out of this world by faith in him to influence the world. You're not to be separated from the world, but to be engaged, not to become a part of the world system, but to influence 
those in the world. That's the reason a lot of the universities, schools yesterday talking about Ohio State University, most universities, Christian universities, started by missionaries. In fact, if you look back at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, these schools were started to train up people who would proclaim the word of God. They started out to train evangelists. Harvard started out with nine students to be a part of equipping them to take the gospel out. And time changes, and a lot of times universities change, but unfortunately the church changes from the mission that it's been given. What is the mission of the church? Well, when Jesus came to earth, he set up a brand new simple plan. Instead of what was known as the temple model, he didn't just kind of tweak it a little bit, but he totally changed the mentality of what was to be known as a gathering. It went from having a high priest and blood sacrifices to making a new covenant with his people. He made a, a new command, a command that those who are gathered together to simply to go and make disciples of all nations. No longer was it the children of Israel exclusive as God's chosen people to bless the nations, but now the Gentiles were given, you and I were given the same responsibility to go out and make disciples, to be disciple makers. And we do that, and we're known as disciples by our love. By our love, we will know, they will know that we are Christians. And then before he returned to heaven, before Jesus returned to heaven, he spent 40 days after the resurrection, and he was seen by over 500 people, and then what happened? He ascended, but he said essentially, go and make pew sitters of all nations. Is that what he said? No, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And history shows us that as time passes and as the church advances, there's a natural tendency to become more inward focused versus outward focused. To be more self-consumed with the colors of this and that versus keeping the main thing the main thing. We become more inward focused instead of outward focused. Jesus came to earth to dwell with us. He became flesh and blood and he dwelt among us as sinners and he came here to make disciples. Do you know this is your mission too, and my mission? That we are all given the same mandate to go and make disciples of all nations. But I would remind you, a disciple can never be made apart from prayer. In the very first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, I'd like you to turn there because the Scripture says this. The Scripture says... If you don't have your Bible, you can look up at the screen. It simply says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. And when he saw the crowds, the scripture says, he had compassion for them because they were as they were harassed and helpless, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples these words, The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, because of that, the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. And from the word, I discover there are four keys. Four keys I would like to just kind of draw your attention to from these verses to seeing and obeying what God intended for us to see, the disciples to see, but for us to see and obey. I want you to check out these first three are found in verse 35. The very first ones you see these words will pop out at you. Go, look, be moved, and pray. Go, look, be moved, and pray. I'm fascinated by the very first part of the section. The first two words in the English language say these words that Jesus went. Jesus taught by example to go because he went. These words express the past tense for the word to what? To go. It doesn't matter if it's the Korean language, which is the word kashipshio, or if it's any other language. It always means the same thing. What does the word go mean? It means don't stay and just sit on it. Get it out. Go and pass on what you've been given. Disciple others is a big part of the Great Commission, but Jesus went. Jesus can tell us because what? He went. He set the example for you and I. And Jesus never asked us to do anything that he himself has not already 
done. Now, going itself is not enough, right? That's the assumed part in this great commission. To go is assumed you will be going. God has asked people throughout history to go, and even though some were going, they didn't always go in the direction God asked them to go in, correct? You think of Jonah? Where was he asked to go? Answer? Nineveh. Where did he go? Tarshish. He was going, but he wasn't going the direction he was supposed to go. You can have good intentions, and I find this happens many times. Young people say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and they start making choices that's sending them the wrong direction, and they're not going to get over here if they're going this direction. It's like you can't get out on 70 and decide you're going to uh, obviously head up to uh, Cleveland and be going south, right? You've got to go north, and so it is with people's choices. You've got to go in the choice that's going to reflect the true intention of your heart that God has put there, and if you don't, you're going to be disobedient. You're going to be going, but you won't be going where he's asked you to go. So just going is not enough in itself. Now think about one man God instructed to go in Scripture after he was blinded on the road of Damascus. His answer, his name was Saul, who became Paul. And did he go where he was supposed to go? Well, he was blinded, and he had some, had, to have some people help him along, but he did get where he was supposed to. And Ananias went too, and he got where he was supposed to, to meet with someone who was the bin Laden of his day. And he was a person that was obedient, even though it had been a fearful thing to do, to what God asked him to do. Nowhere, I want you to notice that Jesus was always about his father's business, but notice where Jesus went. The scripture tells us. We know because it says. Where did it say he went? Answer, he went throughout all the towns and cities. Whoa. It doesn't say he went to some or even most of the towns, but to all of the towns. Do you know why? Answer, Jesus is interested not only in missions but evangelism as well do you know the difference between evangelism and missions let me try to help you out evangelism and missions evangelism is simply presenting christ to people who don't believe in jesus that's the reason last night the word apologetics has been brought in because they don't believe in jesus and maybe obviously have heard about him but they don't believe in him Missions, what's the difference? Well, I would say this. Missions is presenting Christ to people who don't even know there's a Jesus to believe in. So there's a little bit of a difference there. In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, we see the people of Capernaum trying to keep Jesus from leaving them. But Jesus said to them these words. Here's what he says. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for that was what I was sent for. For this purpose, I have come. So notice that Jesus wasn't just random, but he came and he did his Father's will on purpose. Imagine this happening here. What would you say if someone said, I need to go? And they know in their heart that they are to go. Would you get excited about that for them? Or would you say, no, I think it would be better if you just stay right here. I remember my father, when he first came back from Germany during the Korean War, he got saved on the board of a troop ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and he came back and came to the church where his mom was teaching a Sunday school class in Bartlett, Ohio. And I remember him telling the story that that Sunday he came back, the pastor got up and said, we have a new youth leader working with us, going to start working with us. His name is Lou Nichols. And he pointed to my dad and never had a conversation with him beforehand. Afterwards, my dad said, what in the world did you do? Why did you tell them that? I've never had any training in youth ministry. And the pastor said, well, we have a box that's in my office and it has some youth materials. I'll help you out and you'll do just fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Well, that led my father on a path that ended up being 50 years plus serving in youth ministry. That's not usually the most ideal way to introduce someone into service, but that was how my father was drafted. He was drafted by Uncle Sam into the U.S. military, and he was drafted by his church into serving with young people. And it came to a point where he felt he needed more Bible training, and he said, you know, I need to go off to Bible college. And they, why do you need to do that? You're doing such a wonderful job here. <laughs> And they wanted to keep him there, but he knew that God wanted him to go and get some more Bible training. He went off to Philadelphia Bible College. It's now called PBU. He met my mom 
And as a result of that, obviously, I came into being, and so did my other three siblings. But it was starting by my father making a choice to go and do something, even when others around him said, you're not necessarily supposed to do that. You always know it's better to obey God rather than man. Usually, usually, and it should be, those that are mature in the faith and older should be encouraging, equipping young men to do the work of the ministry and women, older women, or teach younger women to do likewise. But unfortunately, that's not always happening. And when it's not, people have to just take a stand and go and do it God's way. Well, Matthew 9, verse 36 gives us a clue what happens next. Because it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. If you're used to underlining, circling in your Bible, I would circle these two words that he saw. And the second word, he had compassion. He saw, he had compassion. The word compassion means in the Greek either a deep love or a deep hate for something. It's a gut level word. In today's language, we might say, when Jesus saw the people, his stomach turned into knots. What causes you to have big knots in your stomach? Perhaps a final exam. It could be a biopsy report from a doctor. It could be a financial problem. It could be divorce papers, the traffic on the road going to or from work. Any of these would simply cause many of us to have our stomachs turned into knots. But what caused Jesus to, to be saying he had that kind of sense of feeling? Answer, lost people. Lost people. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion. So Jesus teaches us by example to look to look. See, the words saw and compassion are linked words because it says when, when he saw. I sometimes wonder in my own self, why is it I don't always have compassion for the lost? Why is it we don't always have compassion for the lost? And why are we not moved? And I would say many times it's because we're not looking, simply because we're not looking. When I was a boy, I was taught by my mom especially to not point or stare at strangers. To not point, to not stare at strangers. Sad to say, we've taught ourselves this rule when it comes to looking at lost people. We're not looking, really, to reach them. After arriving in the United States, going to this uh, inerrancy of Scripture Summit, I was on a plane coming back from Los Angeles, going to Dallas, Texas, and I was quite tired. I'd been involved in the conference was sick one day, had been on a long flight with my family just a few days prior to that. I was kind of interested in just giving, getting a, a time to rest, but the guy seated next to me was from France, and so I began to talk to him. He lived in the United States about 10 years. We just had a little bit of small talk, and I closed my eyes, and I prayed a little bit, saying, God, I know you would like me to speak a little bit more to this gentleman, but I'm tired. Do I really need to do this? And the Lord prompted me saying, yes, this is an opportunity. You don't want to just slip by. And so after a little while, I uh, looked at the gentleman and I began to engage with him a little bit in conversation. He was seated on my right and uh, one of the other people that attended the conference was on my left. And as I began to ask him questions, generally, you know, what he uh, what drew him to the United States, he moved his family here, and he said since coming to the United States that he had switched religions. And so I obviously asked, well, what religion did you switch to? And he said, well, I became a Buddhist. I thought that was awful different. Never met too many Buddhists in the United States. In Korea, there's Buddhism, but it's a different probably flavor. And I began to ask him, what caused you to switch? Or what did you believe in before? And he said, I was a Christian before. I said, really? Why did you switch? And he said it was for practical reasons. And so explain to me, what were the practical reasons that caused you to switch from Buddhism to Christianity? And he said, well, I was really stressed out, and I just found karma gave me a lot of peace, and, and I began to listen to more of what he had to say about enlightenment and listening to one of these monks who was older that he felt like he was learning things from. And I said to him, I said, you know, when I was in high school, I played a lot of basketball. And one of the things that I found out when I played basketball is it's a stress reliever. 
But it doesn't give me hope for eternity. There's nothing there that's going to live forever. All the people put up signboards. The final four was going to be approaching. Mark's Madness is coming in. And I said, you know, I've seen banners here that says, this is what we live for. <laughs> and if that's what you live for, it's pretty short-term lived. And in high school, basketball was my god. I still like basketball today, but there's more to live for than basketball. And I'm thinking in Buddhism, you're getting a little bit of relief from some stress. But if that's all you have to live for, you have a dead god. <laughs> He's not alive. Well, he didn't really necessarily like to hear that. But the more I talked with him, I began to realize that one of the things that helped him practically was to ignore his sin. He didn't like to think about his sin. And Buddhism helped shut out that part and to uplift himself to a point where he was kind of above sin and, and not having to focus on that at all. And I began to tell him, you can't ignore your sin. It doesn't matter how good you are. There's nobody that's good enough. And I'd like to tell you, he, he was gloriously saved. But he wasn't, at least on that flight. But I hope I planted a seed. He did thank me afterwards for sharing with him. I asked if he had a Bible. He said he did not. As I could tell, he had gone way away. And he did tell me he was Roman Catholic. That was his Christian background, was being a part of religion, but without Christ. I'm praying for him now. My prayer is for him from 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Because true enlightenment doesn't come from anything except from the word of God and the inspiration from that comes from God himself to open someone's eyes. If they're dead, they can't open their own eyes. God has to open their eyes. And so I'm praying that that will happen as it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. But I'm afraid many times not only do we don't point, don't stare, don't look, but we have an elevator mentality. In Korea, we have lots of elevators. We live in an apartment that's 18 floors high. We're on the 14th floor. And you know what the rule of the elevator is, right? When you get on the elevator, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to get in the elevator and stare out into space. Whether you're in a shopping center or whatever, you don't dare turn around and talk to the person next to you because that's not considered etiquette. You just stare into space and you get off. Now, fortunately, having young kids... They're not known that that's what you're supposed to do, and sometimes they'll help break the ice with people on elevators and so forth. But you know, that normally doesn't happen with adults because that's the role of the elevator. Do you know one of the most significant problems in missions today is not a lack of programs, finances, or people, but the failure to look, to look and engage. Jesus wants us to follow his example in looking for people who are lost and to get engaged with them. Do you remember the story of the lost boy in Luke 15? You know that story, right? In Luke 15, the Bible says that the father saw his son afar off. And then what does it say in the scriptures? When he saw him, he ran out towards him. He was looking for him. And that's the example of our heavenly daddy who is desiring for anyone to come to their senses and to come home. He was looking and longing for him. Do you have that mentality? Looking, longing for those who are lost to come to the Savior. Well, Matthew 9, verse 37, gives us an example that clothes and people is not what you're to be looking for, even though when you go shopping, that may be something you need to pick up. But while you're there, it's good to be looking and praying that you'll have an opportunity to share, even with someone who's lost in a grocery store, someone in a department store. I don't always do that. Sometimes I'm just in there for, you know, the items to pick up, and I forget that... There's a world that's living there for eternity. And the Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are what, friends? Few. What did he mean when he said that? Let's imagine a farmer coming to you and he says to you, the harvest is plentiful. What does that mean? Does that mean the barns are full? Is that what Jesus had in mind? Jesus was talking about, was he talking about the ripe, the ripe harvest? to be picked but unreached. Is that what he had in mind? We're living right now in the moment of the greatest spiritual harvesting in the history of mankind. You realize that? Do you want to hear some more good news? In my lifetime, the percentage of people who are today professing Christians have gone from 1965 from 5% to now 2015, 12%. In 1945, I'm told, the total Christian population was 80 million people. In 2015, there's around 800 million people. Now, this is really good news. We should be actually clapping. <laughs> you know, if we were at a baseball game and somebody hits a grand slam, everybody's on their feet, right? 
But why is it we really get excited about that? Answer, I'm thinking likely because we don't see that happening around here that often. People walking aisles, getting excited about coming to know Christ, correct? There are more people, though, that are coming to Christ than ever before. That's good news. There are places like Mongolia where people never had religious freedom, didn't have their own Bible until the year of 2000. Today, they have their own copy of the scriptures, and they have the opportunity to come to know Christ through missionaries like they've never had. The Christian population is growing in some places, obviously, like China, India, like never before. Places their persecution where the government, like Mao, tried to stop and burn the Bible and to stop, kick out the missionaries' Christianity, but guess what? God's word could not be stamped out. That's good news. The harvest is truly plentiful. Now, is that what Jesus was talking about? No, Jesus is not talking about the reaped harvest, but the harvest that is still ripe. That is still ripe. Did you know that nine out of ten people are lost and outside of the faith without Jesus Christ? Nine out of ten, basically. But worse than that, two out of every three people who live in the world have never heard an explanation of the gospel one time. Two out of every three. Some of them live right around us. Out of every three people living in the world today, one person has no believing believer living even around the corner close enough to tell them about Jesus, even if they wanted to hear. 2.8 billion have never heard in Asia. 2.8 billion. That's a lot of people. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So what does Jesus say after he says the workers are, are few? Does he say, let's take up a love offering? Is that the answer? No, that's not what it says. Nor is therefore everyone get on an airplane and go. It's not what he says. What does the text say? We're going to check it out. Because the one thing he asks for us to do is the one thing that we tend to do least. The one thing that we tend to do least is the one thing he asks us to do. Jesus says, if you pray, I will send out labors. If you pray, I will send out labors. Ironically, this word send out in the Greek is an interesting term. It's ekbolo, and it means to cast out, to cast out. Do you know that only demons and missionaries are cast out? <laughs> That's right. Only demons and missionaries. It's a strong word. He says that if you really get serious about praying, I will cast out people into the harvest. Remember when the disciples were asked to cast out a demon out of a boy and they couldn't? Remember that story? Jesus came along. And he did it, and they asked Jesus how he did it. Jesus said, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. One man once said that two things that only come by prayer and fasting, and that are those who are demon-possessed and missionaries. <laughs> See, when a congregation starts to really get serious and pray, God is the one that sends out missionaries. God's the one that casts them out. So that should ease your burden thinking you're, you've got to send some people out. Now, God's going to cast them out, but our responsibility is to pray, right? Your responsibility, my responsibility is to pray. And so I would like just to challenge you. As we come to a close tonight, this could be a goal of seeing how God could use you as a body, a church, to even reach more people. Because I believe we have more opportunities today than ever before. And our responsibility as an ecclesia is to see more and better disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just give you a simple formula. My dad gave me growing up a formula for finances. It was called 101080. You know, 10% for the Lord, 10% I could spend any way I wanted, 80% would be put in the bank to go on to college. And that was kind of how I was shaped at the age of eight until I went to college at 18. But here's a little simple plan that I just call 5, 10, 50, 100, all right? First is 5% 5% of converse, conversion growth every year. This is not church swapping, but where people are converted and brought into the church to be discipled and to grow up. To the ecclesia, to the body, to be surrounded by other Christians who can help them to be discipled and grow. 
10% giving themselves to the front line for full-time occupational Christian service. Wouldn't that be an exciting thing to see? 50% of the total church budget going out for evangelism and world missions. Did you know that in the United States alone, more money was spent on Halloween this past year than on missions? Halloween costumes, candy, more is spent on that than has been spent for an entire year on missions. 100% praying for world missions. So there it is, 5, 10, 50, 100. But I want you to go back to what Jesus said because Jesus gives us the solution to this problem of a lack of laborers in his harvest field right in the text. When he says these words, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Jesus says, pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask the Lord to send them out. See, this is what happens when you and I pray. God does his work, the miraculous. When you pray, God stirs in the hearts of people. And that's what happened in my life. You know what? I went on a short-term mission trip. There were many people here. My mom got to pray for me because my purpose in going wasn't really the right purpose. I went on a basketball team to play basketball. Couldn't go to basketball camp. It was an excuse to go overseas on a mission trip to play basketball. But God stirred in my heart and he worked. And I believe it was because people right here in the seats were praying for yours truly. And I changed. I was, I was amazed. I came back, some of the other players, their lives didn't radically change, but I wanted to become a world Christian like I never had before. And it, I couldn't really figure it out, didn't even know why. But I believe, looking back, it was because people were praying. See, Jesus taught us an example to pray. And as soon as he sent the disciples out, or as soon as they finished praying, what does he do? He, t he tells us in the next chapter, in Matthew 9, 37, 38, he says to pray. In verse, chapter 10, verse 1, no sooner did they pray, the prayer request is answered. Notice how it was answered. Jesus brought the twelve together. He sent them into the fields. And Jesus says these words, the harvest was truly plenteous. The workers are few. Therefore, pray. And guess what? When they surrendered, the solution was resolved. See, the purpose of prayer is for us to surrender our will, not to impose our will on others. To surrender. Say, God, wherever, whatever, I am available. Do you have that mentality? Lord, use me in any way you see fit. Because each of us are called to pray. You are called to pray. I am called to pray. And Jesus says in Matthew 13, my house, my ecclesia shall be a house of prayer. And so tonight as we finish this missions conference, I believe that the Lord would have us to get serious about prayer. As we get serious about praying, saying, God, whatever you want to do in my life, and I'm going to start getting engaged in praying for these people around me who are lost. I'm also going to get engaged in discipling some new believers that, I know we need that in Korea. We have many people that they get swept up by the cults because they've never been grounded in their faith. They've never had someone to disciple them. And that's one of the things that we see a great vision and burden for in and amongst the Korean churches is equipping them to disciple young believers because many times they've never been discipled. But you and I are on mission. And God wants us to join him to get serious about committing our lives to him. Because at the end of the day, the purpose of prayer is simply to surrender my will and not 